Welcome to the Wild Wisdom Podcast with Dr. Patricia Mills. I'm Dr. Patricia. This podcast is for people who want to transform their health, restore their hormones, and reconnect to their body's natural wisdom. Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia. I'm a Canadian medical doctor, published author, internationally recognized researcher, and passionate advocate for your health. Here, we'll explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and cutting-edge science, distilling the essence of true health into practical steps you can take. Wild wisdom is instinctive knowledge in action. Thanks for making this part of your day. The mouth is a really great starting point to um, speak about when we're talking about health. If all disease uh, begins and ends in the gut, then the mouth is the beginning of that journey. And we now know that um, oral health, health of the mouth, is um, a huge determinant um, for so many conditions. Like we've linked um, poor um, health in the mouth with things like strokes, heart attacks, dementia, Alzheimer's. I mean, it's it's quite an, an, an incredible. And there's actually a lot of reasons for that. Um, first, we'll start about like, what is the function of the mouth, which is kind of funny. Like obviously it's for speaking, for, for nonverbal communication with, you know, kissing. Um, so it's a point of contact between humans as well, which is really interesting, right? That it's responsible for that job as well. Um, and the teeth are responsible for chewing our food and breaking it down so that we can actually, you know, get it to the point where it's easily digestible and absorbable by our body. That's a point where people really um, miss out on their nutrition and their health is by not chewing enough. And then you have all of the saliva that has a lot of different enzymes, little tools that our body makes to break down the food more. And then there's a microbiome in your mouth, and that's the microorganisms, the little organisms that you can't see unless you have a microscope, bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, those kinds of things that live in the mouth. That It's not that it's a bad thing. In fact, it's a normal thing. What's bad is if you have too many of the bad guys and not enough of the good guys, that can cause your health, the health in the mouth to be affected poorly. And then there's the gums right? Which is a very sensitive tissue um, and the tongue as well. So very, very sensitive tissue, um, which can easily bleed if it's inflamed. So if, if it, if the, if your mouth health is not um, in a good state, the gums can bleed. And one way to know whether or not your mouth is healthy is if when you're flossing your teeth, it should not be bleeding. You should floss gently. That's one thing that people do wrong is they, they floss kind of traumatically, but you're doing gentle flossing and your gums are bleeding, like you're getting blood, that's your body language saying your mouth is not healthy and you need to do something about it. And the other thing that's really interesting is the tongue. Okay. So the tongue is, has like um, lymphatics that come out at the very back of the tongue and it's connected to your, to your gut and whatever you don't have, whatever you don't digest properly in your, in your gut will come out at the back of your tongue as like a white coating. And that's the bacteria that feed on that undigested food. I think in Ayurveda, they call it ama. And um, so if you have like poor oral health, another body language is your tongue will have like a coating of like white or brown or green, you know, some, and that's like the microorganisms, your microbiome is overgrowing in that area. And that's not a good sign. That's a sign that something's going on there. Now the teeth are interesting because um, when I was in medical school, you know, the dentists had their own kind of separate training from the doctors. And now I like, it's kind of interesting that that's the case because the teeth are a reflection of your skeleton. So here's a fact. If your teeth are crowded around, you know, in your mouth, then your, your pelvis is probably narrow and crowded, you know, and your, and your ribs, like your teeth are not living in a separate, um, on a separate planet from your body. They are connected. It's, it's, it's part of your skeleton. And whatever is affecting the development of your teeth is affecting the development of your entire skeleton. And what affects the development of your, of your teeth and your skeleton? Well, we know from the work of this incredible man, basically the Indiana Jones of real life, by the name of Dr. Weston A. Price. He was a dentist, okay, in like the 1930s and 40s. And um, this man is just, I love the story of this man. You see a picture of him, he's like, you know, kind of, bald with glasses and very, very, you know, sweet smile, you would not know that this man is, is Indiana Jones in flesh. So basically what happened was that he was a dentist 
who was doing research in the 1930s and 40s, and he was also practicing. So he was seeing patients for their dental hygiene. And he was noticing that his younger patients were coming in with more and more cavities. Like they didn't have cavities. Cavities were like almost a rarity in his practice. And then all of a sudden, all these kids were coming in with cavities and they were coming in with really crowded teeth, like, you know, the upper teeth kind of sticking out and uneven and crooked. And it happened within like a generation. It was very quickly, you know, I mean, he saw it within a few years of his practice and he was curious as to why was this happening? So this, again, like, remember I said, functional medicine is like the root cause. Why? He was a functional medicine dentist, so to speak, with that kind of mentality. He was like, why are my patients getting this? He wasn't just like, okay with, okay, let me just fix your cavity. And, you know, here you go kind of thing. Right. It was like, no, what's going on here? So what he did was he um, closed up shop um, for uh, a few years and he went with his wife and he visited uh, 14 countries on five continents. He went by planes, trains, automobiles, boats, donkeys on foot. You know, he, he went everywhere. And this is what he was looking for. He had a very, he was this, a researcher, remember? So he had a very scientific plan. And I, don't, I, I just love it because it's so original. I never would have thought of this myself, but... He had a theory that it was something in the Western culture, like something that people were either exercising differently or um, eating differently. So he was like, okay, what is it about the Western culture that's causing this? Like, I want to understand. So he, he purposely went to countries and then within the country, he would go to places where he was looking for this specific combination of events where there would be two villages and they would be separated by distance but they would have similar um, genetic and ancestry. So they had like, you know, he went to Switzerland. It was like two villages in Switzerland and they were close enough that they, a lot of the people shared the same genetics, like they were related in some way. But the difference was that one village was accessible um, to Western culture by like train or by a port, you know, or road. And, And the other village was more remote, harder to get to. So they did not have access to Western culture, foods and, and traditions. Okay. And so he went to like Switzerland and Ireland and the Pacific Islands and um, uh, Africa, and he went to all of these different places. He went there and he analyzed people's teeth. So he, he would go into the village, get to know the villagers, make friends, so to speak. And then he would get permission to open up their mouth and do a dentist exam. And he would take pictures. He took pictures of like thousands of mouths. He would count the cavities and he would do assessments of like the jaw size and, and that sort of thing. And then he would document um, what were those people eating and how were they exercising? What was their lifestyle? And he also took samples of their food and brought it back home to his lab and analyzed it for nutritional content. And what he found was just absolutely fascinating. And if you read his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, I'll have to double check that and put it in the notes, that, that title. It's a very, very thick book with lots of pictures in it because he... He knew that if he just went home and told people about it, no one would believe him. He took all the pictures to prove like his, his theory was correct. And so what he found was that in the villages where they were uh, having access to um, the, the modern foods that they were being exposed to were specifically flour, white uh, sugar, refined sugar and foods made with those. So jams and preservatives and jellies and um, canned foods. So processed canned foods. Those were like the things that people were getting. So they were convenience foods. They were supposed to make people's lives in those villages easier because they would take the flour, take the sugar, and they would make things like breads out of it, um, you know, quick rising breads, as opposed to in the traditional villages, they would have to raise their crop, take the grains, they would um, ferment the grains, um, a very slow rising bread that would take three to four or five days to ferment. So sourdough bread, like real sourdough bread, and it would be whole grains. It wouldn't be refined like into a flour. So it was whole grains, soaked, fermented um, sourdough bread. And so um, it, it was laborious. It would take definitely more time. And so these villagers who were getting exposed to this white sugar and flour were grateful because they could just quickly make like a, a flatbread or a bannock. You know, that's where a lot of the bannock came from in indigenous cultures was from that actually. That was the major difference was the exposure to flour and sugar. 
And also in the traditional cultures, uh, he analyzed it. And what he found was throughout all of the cultures that were in the villages that were remote, whether it was Switzerland or Iceland or um, uh, sorry, Ireland, uh, Africa, all those countries that I mentioned, there were, there were similarities amongst the ways that they ate. So first I'm going to tell you the results and I'm going to tell you what was the eating pattern that got the good results. So what he found was that in the people who were in, exposed to the modern foods, they had terrible cavities. Okay, the first, and he divided them into first generation, second generation, third generation. So the first generation of exposure, the second generation, in some villages, they had been exposed long enough that there was second and second generation. So the children of the people who were first exposed and then the children exposed and then the children's children. So third generation. And he found that in the first generation, they started to get cavities. In the second generation, they got worse cavities and they got crowding of the teeth, like really, really bad crowding of the teeth. And they got narrowing of the jaw. So the jaw, instead of being wide and kind of almost square looking, the jaw started to get narrow and kind of slim through the jaw. And in the third generation, it was affecting even their, like, um, he called it like their behaviors. Like they were apathetic. They were kind of depressed. They were lower energy. They weren't as happy as the people who were not, not exposed to these. And so he took pictures and it's really quite pronounced where Regardless of which culture you're looking at, whether it was from, um, you know, one of the five different continents, they all had, you know, pictures of beautiful, the, when they weren't exposed to the modern culture, they were still remote enough. They had beautiful jaw structure, gorgeous white teeth, all lined up in a row, like little, you know, tic tacs, all da 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 da, beautiful. And this was in cultures that had no dentists. These people did not have dentistry care and they did not even brush their teeth. So they had plaque. But once he cleaned off the plaque, the tooth underneath was pristine with virtually no cavities. And they didn't have fluoride in the water, right? They didn't have their yearly checkups, nothing. These people had beautiful teeth. So clearly there was something about their lifestyle, what they were eating and drinking and what they were exposed to, movement, that kind of stuff, that um, was, was promoting healthy teeth. And the people in the villages that were exposed to sugar were showing the cavities, the crowding, and the worsening with each generation that is exposed to that. And he analyzed it for exercise and um, exposure to like sunlight, you know, vitamin D. And he found that, um, you know, these people still had similar exercise levels and they st still had similar um, going outside and that. And they were close enough that it wasn't something geographical. This had to do primarily with the exposure of the modern foods. Okay. And then he was like, well, okay, now I know what's causing cavities is this highly processed, re you know, refined flours and sugars and, you know, whatever's made out of that, like the jams and the jellies and preservatives and the cookies and the pastries and all that kind of stuff. And then he was like, okay, well, what is in the diet of these healthy um, villagers across all, you know, continents and countries that is promoting good tooth health? What he found was that here's, a, here's the commonalities. They all ate nose to tail. So whatever animal that they would have, they would eat all of the parts of the animal. So they would eat like the liver, they would eat the kidneys, um, you know, uh, the brain. Um, uh, and in fact, if they had a surplus of, of animals, they would leave the muscle meat aside. They would not take the muscle meat. They would take the fatty meat. They were looking for like the pork belly, you know, bacon. Everybody loves bacon. Um, you know, they actually didn't want the lean meat. And in fact, in Australia, there's a thing called rabbit fever where when they when um, hunting season is low um, for the um, indigenous people there and they are starting to run out of hunting like animals and they they have to just eat rabbits and, 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 you know, they weren't able to like get enough fat. They would get what's called rabbit fever because they weren't getting enough fat. And, and he was like, okay, well, what is it about the fat? That is so important. And he analyzed the um, fat, the animal fat, and he found that there were four vitamins that were found in the animal fat, and that's vitamins A, D, E, and K. And uh, he actually, vitamin K, um, K2, he it hadn't even been discovered yet, actually. He discovered it, and he, because it never had been identified, he, fought, he called it vitamin X. He's like, oh, what's this new vitamin, right? Um, and over time, what it is, is that uh, vitamin K2, which, you know, was named vitamin K2 over time, 
it's what takes the minerals like calcium from your food, like it gets into your blood and it takes the minerals from, from your blood and puts it into the bone. Okay. So it's like the usher. It's like, come here, calcium, go into the bone. If you don't have enough vitamin K2, the calcium will go into your tissues, like your muscles and your ligaments and your tendons and, you know, so that where you don't want it to go. And then you get what's called calcified deposits. So calcific tendonitis, and people get that around the shoulders and can be quite painful sometimes. Um, and then vitamin D, obviously, is, a, I mean, I don't know if people know this, and some of you probably do, but uh, vitamin D is an important, it's actually a hormone. You know, it's so funny, they call it a vitamin, but it's actually a hormone. And it's an important hormone for sending signals throughout the body, including signals on how to build bone, strong bones. So you need those four, four vitamins slash hormone um, in, in addition to minerals. So the other thing that they had uh, all had in common was that they all had access to sea salt. Why is this important? Because sea salt, real sea salt, has at least has a, on average 82 minerals in it. Table salt has two minerals, sodium and chloride, but real sea salt has 82 minerals in it. This is important because the bone, for example, is made up of 12 minerals in addition to um, many other things like um, protein and fat. And so, you know, it, they had a source of minerals that their body could take and use to make the bone. So they had the hormones telling their bones how to grow. They had the minerals to create the bones. They had the protein and the fat to create the bones, right? The building blocks of bones. And they didn't have anything that got in the way of that signaling. So when you eat sugar and flour, we now know, he didn't know this at the time, Dr. Price, but we now know that when you eat sugar and, and processed flour, it um, causes an increase in the hormone insulin. And that increase in that one hormone causes a total cascade of issues with the other hormones, which can affect things like how your bone grows. And when you start being affected by it at a young age, like, you know, your, your, your parents having that in their diet and then while you're in the baby's belly and then as you come out and, and you're yourself, uh, you know, like growing up, now we know that that can impact how your bones develop and the teeth are the windows into your skeleton. You can't see your skeleton from the outside. The only way you can see it is through your teeth. So your, the health of your teeth are to a certain extent, especially the, the alignment of them and cavities and that kind of stuff is, is reflecting that your internal health as well, not just the health like superficially in your mouth, but actually your internal hormone regulation. And so um, the other things that he found about um, what these people were doing is that they always had a whole grain. So it, it could be, um, you know, corn or it could be oats or it could be wheat, but they took a lot of care to prepare it. They never turned it into fine flour, like that refined flour. They would take the whole grain and they would either soak it or sprout it or ferment it, or in the case of corn, put it with lime, you know, to, to take out the acidity and to, uh, to alter the chemical structure of these grains. Because if you eat a lot of these grains and they're not properly prepared, they, are, they can be very irritating to the digestive tract. Why? Because the plants put chemicals in them to protect their babies, their seeds, their grains from being overeaten. By insects and to them were just big insects so these cultures had very traditional ways of preparing their grains so they would always take off the husk of the rice so they would have white rice right they wouldn't have brown rice why because the brown the husk had a lot of those plant chemicals they would um and then they would soak the rice and they would rinse it until it came out clean and with the oats they would soak it and ferment it with the with the corn, they would um, soak it, ferment it, um, align it, you know. Quinoa. Quinoa was never a quick cook grain in, um, you know, Peru and those countries. They would always very carefully prepare their grains. So that's something that he found to be another commonality. Um, they didn't necessarily always have abundant um, access to um, vegetables, but they almost all had seasonal vegetables like wild greens. Um, little vegetable plants, for example, in Switzerland. And so they would use that. Um, and they always made sure to have um, a really good source of that fat. And if they had a hard time getting animals like hunting animals, they would take their domesticated animals and get milk. And that was in very specific cultures like um, Africans, like the Maasai and um, in Switzerland. And they would take that milk, but they would keep it raw. 
because there were enzymes and, and products in the milk that helped digest the milk. And they would take that milk and they would, um, they would keep the milk, especially with the milk that was milked in summertime. Why? Because those animals out grazing in the summer had more vitamin D. And their vitamin D that they made would get into their milk and they would take that vitamin D rich butter and that would very purposely give it to the growing children and the people who were planning on getting pregnant. They would save the best of their, of their crops and their animals and their butter, everything like that, because they knew that these were people who were either ready to make a, a human or in the process of making themselves. And they knew that if they didn't provide that high level quality of food to those individuals, those individuals would um, not turn out to be robustly healthy. And the tribe, the village, the whole village would suffer if, some, if a child was de developing Ill, in ill health or was born in ill health, right? It takes a lot of resources to, um, for a village or a tribe to take care of an individual. So that is sick. So, so he, he made many observations. And the one last one I want to leave you with, which I found was really fascinating, is because because he knew that the teeth were a reflection of the internal organs, he also asked the woman about their difficulties with childbirth. Because he was like, oh, if the teeth are crowded, the pelvis must be crowded. I wonder if that's something. And sure enough, he found that um, the women in the villages that were, ex that were not exposed were, had very easy, easy childbirth. Like they would all just have it at home. Very rarely would get into a complication. Whereas the women in the, in the um, villages that had the modern food diets, they were running into um, huge complications with their childbirth. They were having a hard time delivering the babies. The babies would get stuck. And when he would examine the woman, they had narrow pelvises to match their narrow teeth. And he hypothesized that it was a, as a result of the whole skeleton being affected. You know, and it's very interesting because if you look at anthropology, if you look at the research of people who look at the study of bones, if you look before Western medicine and you look at fractures, like people who had fractures and you see the healing, they had really lovely healed bones. Like any fracture would heal very robustly, like strong, thick bone. And after modern foods were introduced, that you would see more that these fractures would not heal as well. They, and, uh, and sometimes they wouldn't even heal. And as a physical medicine rehab specialist, I would see this in my practice where people would come in with what's called delayed he healing or non-union. The bones wouldn't even unite. And that's when we started to have to use things like electrical therapy and, and those kinds of things to stimulate the bone growth. So what it boils down to is that, and I'll have to do you know, additional episodes in the future to talk about like what's ideal mouth, you know, care and oral care and all that kind of stuff in the, in the context of having a microbiome that you have to nurture and not kill um, and strip, right? That's not the way that you go about oral health. But what we do know is that nutrition is key. And I, having been a, a sweet tooth child myself, um, I see pictures of myself. I, you know, I had um, pretty straight teeth up until a certain age, and then I started to get, you know, crowding of the teeth, and I had a lot of cavities. Um, I had to have braces to get my teeth realigned, and uh, I now know that um, it was probably as a result of of what I was eating, and my my parents simply didn't know. We, you know, this is not common knowledge, although it should be, and I hope it will be. Um, and so, if you're and I don't take it to be like um, a reprimand for a parent when a child has cavities. However, I do think it's an excellent opportunity to say, okay, what is it that's going on here and what can we change to make this better? The cavities are a signal to us that there's something about what we're doing that has to change. Um, and the cool thing is that there's research to show that you can actually um, reverse a cavity. You can, um, you know, treat a cavity without, uh, by, simply by nutrition and get that cavity healed, so to speak, and even re regrow the enamel of the tooth. Um, so it's not like you got a cavity and there's nothing you can do about it. There's so much you can do about it. And I find that incredibly empowering. And the wisdom of Dr. Price and what he found in terms of nutrition um, is something that I often go to because it's an incredible, what you call observational study a body of observational research and the pictures when you see them, I mean, it, they simply cannot be denied. And when I have applied this to myself and my family, I definitely have seen the results, um, really wonderful results. And as a mother, the person who in my family is responsible for providing uh, the food and the snacks and the drinks and all that kind of stuff for my kids, you know, I just feel like I, I, I feel so at peace and confident knowing that I'm doing the right things for them. And um, it's a great feeling, you know, doing that. Thank you for 
for taking the time to listen to this podcast, Wild Wisdom with Dr. Patricia Mills. If you like this podcast, please take the time to like and subscribe. And please feel free to leave any comments and look below for the contact information if you want to connect with me directly. Thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day, evening or night. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast is not a substitute for a professional care doctor or other qualified medical professional. This podcast is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you are looking for help in your journey, it is important that you seek out a qualified health practitioner. If you would like to work with Dr. Patricia for her expert health transformation guidance, please email her at info at drpatriciamills.com to book a discovery call. You can also find Dr. Patricia on Instagram at Dr. Patricia Mills and Facebook at Wild Wisdom for Women with Dr. Patricia Mills, MD. For access to all of Dr. Patricia's educational videos and more amazing perks, consider becoming a Patreon member. Links are in the description of this episode. It is important to have an expert in your corner that can help you make the changes you crave, especially when it comes to your health. 